Today, we are here to celebrate the founding of the University Honors College and to make a very special announcement. Today, we are announcing that trustee and Boston University alumnus Rajan Kilachan, who's sitting on the front row, graduate of School of Management 1974, has pledged a gift of $25 million, the largest gift in Boston University's history, to endow the University Honors College in the name of his parents. We are trying to connect faculty and students across the university to fashion a community dedicated to innovation and imagination. This means that by spanning the structural holes between groups, this college provides a basis or a site for cooperative, rigorous experimentation for the entire university. Second, we want to connect the arts, sciences, and professions in a different way to create a new notion of what a liberal education is, a notion in which the usual divide between pure knowledge and applied knowledge begins to fade away. We want to prepare our students to enter a world where they'll have to muster a variety of approaches, the approaches of anthropology, psychology, politics, engineering, as you told us in Dubai, Rajan, among others, to address the complex problems before us. Finally, we want to connect research and teaching as closely as possible. This entails exposing students to the creative work of their professors early on and fostering their ability to do creative work of their own, both before and after they leave here. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to, uh, to share a little with you. It's a little different theme. So, uh, you know, that, that last talk, a lot of uh, big ideas. This is more science-y. My colleague, uh, Supriya Chakrabarti in the Department of Astronomy, and I uh, collaborated on a project. We're sending one of these mirrors into space, and we're going to look for planets outside of our solar system. It's launching in eight days. So eight days from now, this rocket goes up, hope it doesn't blow up, takes some pictures, and sends them back. And so how does this relate to the UHC? Our plan is to, is to, when the data comes back, see if the students can see whether the data came back and showed things that, uh, that we were looking for, and then see if the DM still looks good or not. I have an appointment in the International Relations Department and also in the History Department. So in history, we're concerned about the past. Uh, in IR, we're concerned about the present. And as Charles suggested, most of my research and writing really focuses on the integration between the two. What I want to do very briefly this afternoon is talk to you about the course that I'm teaching uh, in UHC. The title of the course is War for the Greater Middle East. But really, the purpose of the course, I think, is suggested uh, here by this title. What we're really examining is the possibility of revising or reinventing the narrative of the 20th century that will have application to young people who are going to live their lives in the 21st century. We live in a, in a very difficult world. There's a world outside Boston. There's a world outside the US. There's a world out there that does not have even the basic necessities that we take for granted. Now imagine yourself in a situation in rural Zambia, where I work a lot, where there is no power very poor literacy, but there is a problem of pneumonia. Well, you have to solve it, right? As engineers, as quantitative thinkers, as thinkers, as, as great students of this university, how do you solve it? So what you do is you think about what is out there. Well, there are two things that are common. One is plenty of sunlight, and the second one is, of course, cell phone, right? So what my students did, they came up with a system where you wear this little thing across your shoulder, you can put it in your backpack, you can just put it outside, and what it does is it takes old cell phone batteries that people have discarded and it charges them. And people change their cell phones very commonly here, they change their cell phones even more commonly in the developing world. So it charges those batteries, those batteries go into a device, and that device basically has a simple circuit that can measure oxygen and pulse. Poetry is the center of my life and the core of all my other work, my teaching, my scholarly critical writing, translation, biography. 
I try to introduce students to this ancient art of spellbinding in order to awaken their full intelligences, integrating the sensory, the emotional, and the rational. In the course I'm teaching this fall, Literature and Hunger, we read classic and modern works, Homer, parts of the Hebrew Bible and Christian scripture, the letters of St. Catherine of Siena, Milton's Paradise Lost, Kafka, some contemporary poems, strictly from the point of view of the consumption of food. Day by day, students learn to proceed from observation to analysis to interpretation, drawing on anthropology, theology, psychology, and yes, literary criticism. We ask, what is food? Who eats what and why? Who eats whom? What is sacrifice, human or animal? What makes it sacred? What's forbidden? Why? How do we make the meanings in which we live? The marvelously bright and ambitious students in the University Honors College are hungry for knowledge and hungry to think about thinking. And poetry is one way of helping them to do that. <laughs> 